Hey everybody, welcome back to the Engineered Angler. I know it's been a while since we had a full video with a brand new build, but this is it. We're gonna do the first one this year, so happy new year. And before we move on, I just wanna say thank you to everybody who tried to lend a hand by offering maybe some ideas of where I could get the uh, fuel tank pulled out of my boat. None of them panned out, but I did make some headway. And if you stick around to the end, I'll show you where I am on that project. So let me show you what I wanna make. I want to make a mini popping frog, not a micro one, but one that's maybe an inch and a half. Small enough that I'm only going to use one treble hook at the very bottom. So it's going to be a little bit like this little scorpion frog I made a long time ago. You guys might remember it. It's got the detachable single hook that stays up with a magnet. This thing is really lethal and really weedless. You can run this thing through just about anything. The one we're going to make, probably not so much, probably just run it along the weed's edge. But I think the size is gonna make the difference. I'm gonna make this one out of cedar. And I happen to have this like one by three quarter piece of uh, cedar stock. This stuff always smells good to me. I'm gonna go ahead and get it drawn on here and then we'll get it cut out. All right, so that's a pretty handy technique for getting that three-dimensional shape cut out by keeping it attached to the original stock while I'm cutting both the front and back profile, the side profile. I'm able to keep the sides and top and bottom square to each other, which just makes it a little easier in all the shaping. Now I'm gonna take this ellipse guide and draw an ellipse on the front here for the shape of the mouth. This way I have sort of a shape target on the front. And when I take it out to the uh, belt sander, I have a good visual indication of if I'm getting the shape right. That should be good enough to get started with. And I'm also putting a few guidelines just for the round over on the belly. All right, that's a pretty good start. I got the general shape pretty much set into it. All right, before I get any farther along on the uh, on sanding and refining the shape, I'm gonna go ahead and grind out the popping mouth. And to do that, I'm gonna use this little rasp ball bit. And I'll use that on my pneumatic die grinder. Now, if you don't have a, a die grinder or anything like this, you can always drill out the hollow for the mouth with consecutively larger drill bits make the hole shallow but wide and then sand it out and then you can put a little bit of epoxy putty in there sand that out and you can get a nice smooth hollow it works it just takes a little longer than grinding it out quickly with an air tool so that's pretty good it's a little rough, but it's pretty much the shape I was looking for. It's got a nice deep and broad kind of hollow in it. Should make a good pop. Now I've just gotta go ahead and refine the shape a little bit with some sanding boards and that sort of thing. It's all gonna be handwork. The gloves are so I can hold on to this little tiny thing. And I'll get back to you when I've got it smooth and getting close to the next step. All right, here's what the shape looks like after some refinement. And before I get any further into sanding or smoothing this thing out at all, I'm gonna go ahead and put a real thin clear coat of UV resin 
and stick it in the chamber for about an hour. And that'll probably do it for tonight. As you can see, it's already nighttime out there and I need to go get my dinner and we'll get back on it tomorrow. All right, I got this thing out of the chamber and the clear coat came out, eh, okay. There's definitely some rough spots and that's what I'm doing. I'm sanding it down, getting rid of the flaws and getting it ready for the next step, which is gonna be putting in the tie on eye on the front and the little hook hanger right here at the belly. Now, while I'm sanding this stuff, I really should go ahead and put whatever weight I need in it in so I can just sand that back as well and that'll make it ready for paint. But the question is how much to add. Now I just want to have a little tiny weight up here by the head on the belly and that's simply to make it a little more head heavy because the hook will be hanging back here where there's a lot less flotation and I don't want it to be totally tail down when it's sitting in the water still. And the way I'm going to decide how much to add is by weighing this thing and using the density of this cedar to figure out the volume of this little tiny plug. And that actually brings me to the question of the week. And that question is, what kind of wood do I use for any particular lure? And a lot of times the question is couched like, hey, what's the very best wood for making lures? And that's really an impossible question to answer. It depends a lot on how you're making it, what's important to you, and what aspects of the build you're really focusing on. For instance, if you're heavy into carving and getting really precise, clean carved, then it's gonna be important to you that the wood carves nicely, regardless of its density. And density is really the key factor, unless you're looking at grain and the beauty of grain because you're gonna leave it a uh, sort of a nude lure. Here's one I made out of teak, even the bib is teak, and typically a good carving wood will be something on the denser side. A wood that comes from a tree that's slow growing, has a very tight grain, usually will be a lot more sort of buttery when you carve it. But personally, I don't really look at carving as my most important deciding factor. To me, it's all about density. And as you can see on these little pieces, these are all samples from pieces of wood that I've taken and determined the density. Here's, this is camphor, I've got red maple, teak, balsa, cherry wood, I even got a piece of oak in here, and of course cedar, which is a piece from the same wood I use for this lure, and its density is 0.396 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's important to me because I focus on functionality of the lure. I want the lure to behave a specific way, and controlling the weight of it, its balance, and its static stability, the way that lure just sits, is really important on how stable that lure is gonna be when it's running, how it's gonna cast, and how it's gonna behave when it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, whether it's cranking or twitching or just a topwater lure. Topwater lures being the simplest lure to decide what kind of wood you wanna use. Because basically you want something that floats relatively well. You can even use oak, a really dense wood, because as long as the lure will float all the hardware you put on it, it really doesn't matter too much. But on crankbaits, you want that dynamic stability. So you wanna go with the lightest wood you can stand to go with. Sometimes balsa is a good idea but not always, because remember, balsa is not only light, it's soft and it's weak. So you'll have to make up for that in your design. Typically, a middle of the road density is what you're gonna look for. Something along the lines of cedar, camphor, even maple. While maple is kind of a hardwood, it still has a reasonable density, especially the wood you find around here runs less than 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. And remember, water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So any wood that's less than half the specific gravity of water, which that would make it 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter or less, is gonna be light enough to do just about anything with. Now it's really easy to develop sort of a favorite wood to work with. I really like camphor. It has a density of around 0.4 grams per cubic centimeter, and that makes it really light, but it's still a hard enough wood that it'll take a little bit of carving and hold up to a good bite. Now, it's a little hard to get a hold of, and I'm lucky that I've been able to harvest some wood just off my property, but it is available in some places. And it also smells like Bengay, which that's not so good. And for when I'm making a lure that really needs a tough wood that's gonna carve really nicely, I usually use cherry. It's easily available to me, and the finished grain is really pretty. But I'd like to hear your opinion. Are you stuck on a particular wood you like to use to make lures? And what kind of wood do you think 
technique you've used and you'd like to see me try using on future builds. I'm curious. Leave your examples and opinions in the comments. I'd really appreciate it. All right, let's get back to the build. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and twist these eyes. This way we'll have them for the weight calculation. All right, that does it for that one. I'm using this 108 pound test stainless steel leader wire. And you can find all this stuff in my Amazon store, including these twisting pliers. All right, just need to cut them length and we're ready to make some calculations. All right, with the scale zero, to put the body on there and we get 4.85. So I take 4.85 and I divide it by the density of cedar, which this particular cedar is 0.396 grams per cubic centimeter. And I get 12.25 more or less. And that is actually the volume of the body in cubic centimeter. So once we know the volume of the body, we can use that volume to inform us that this cannot be any heavier than 12.25 grams or it will begin to sink. Now we don't want it anywhere near there. So let's weigh the body, the hook I'm gonna use, the split ring I'm gonna use for it, and the two twist eyes, and we get 5.63 grams. So that's much lighter than the 12.25 grams that is our limit. So I can actually add a gram to the bottom of this and still be at about half our max. And that's what I'm gonna do. And here's a little split shot that is really close. 1.14. We'll go with that. That'll still keep us well below our limit. And I'm drilling the hole as far forward as I dare to drill it. And there you go. That'll do it. Now I just need to cover that hole up with a little bit of UV resin and we'll be ready to go. And in about 15 to 20 seconds, this will be ready to sand back. And there you go. That should be easy enough to sand back. Here I'm drilling a hole through the back of the lure so I can mount the legs. All right, the next step is to get some two-part epoxy, some quick set stuff into the hole. Now these two holes are actually connected. It's one single hole. So I want to inject two-part epoxy in there and just fill that up. This way, if I inject it through this hole, comes out here, I know it's full. And what I've done is just squirt some two-part epoxy into this little mini Ziploc bag. And then I can just knead it all the way to the bottom and then just mix it up by kneading it. Then I'll get it all into one corner like so and just snip off the tiniest bit of the corner. And now I can use this as a piping bag and I'll just squeeze in here until I start seeing it come out the other end. I'm just starting to see it coming out of the other end. So I'm gonna go ahead, wipe off the excess and insert these guys. All right, now it's just a matter of waiting for this to set and we'll get the painting. And you can see how the little tiny weight gives it a lot of stability. All right, we're ready to paint. I've got it on my lure holder and all I need to do right now is to wipe it down with some alcohol. I'm going to give it a base coat of opaque yellow. This is a testers.
All right, I'm pretty happy with the paint job. Frog patterns are just fun to paint because there's a million ways to do them. So now I'm gonna let this paint dry for a little while and give it a couple of coats of the Minwax polyacrylic. Let that dry and then it's clear coat time. All right, let's see how this thing came out. Looks like a little toy frog. All right, it's time to assemble this. I wanna put the tail on it. Now, I had originally wanted to put some legs on there with little feet on it, but it really isn't gonna work out because they're just gonna be sitting a little too flat and I'm not really liking the way they look. So I'm gonna do the kind of thing I did with this little worm head and get some of these silicone skirt fibers and stick them in the hole in the tail. See how that comes out. All right, I got an assortment of colors here. Here's the green. Of course, that's gonna go really well, but I'm wondering if I shouldn't go with some contrast, maybe something brighter, like this yellow and brown. Yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna go with. So I'm gonna take this thin piece of wire and bend a tiny hook in it, and with a pair of pliers, just pinch it down so it's small enough that it'll fit through the hole. I'm gonna squeeze it down just a little more. All right, that'll do it. And then I'm gonna hook the skirt material onto that little hook. We'll poke the wire through the hole and then just slowly pull pull this through, holding on to the rest of these fibers so they stretch and get thin. This way I can pull it through, stretch them out so even them out. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Now I'm just gonna stick a little bit of UV resin around the lo these little rubber fibers and make sure they don't come sliding out. All right, there you go. That's what it looks like in the sunshine. Let's see what it looks like in the water. I really like the way it looks in the water. All right, let's see how it casts. Nice. All right, I think that's a winner. I just need to get out in the water and actually fish with it. That'll have to do it. I'm pretty happy with this little guy. And as promised, I'm gonna give you a quick update here on the status of the fuel tank repair. And after that, there'll be a little slideshow of the little mini frog in the sunlight. See you all next Friday. I got a hold of a chain hoist, found a tree with a good strong limb, and hoisted off the center console in two pieces. Then I strapped up the uh, tank and started hoisting on that, but it was hung up pretty quickly, and it took a little bit of work to get it to free up. But I finally got it going, and I was able to hoist it up high enough just drive the boat out from under it. But when I looked up at it, I found this thing. Man, that looks like it might be my problem right there. Now it's just a matter of finding a tank that's gonna fit with all the fittings in the right place. Enjoy the slideshow.